All right, good morning, church. So good to be here with you this morning. If you're visiting with us, we welcome you. We are genuinely glad that you are here. If you would, do us a favor. There is a Connect card in the chair back in front of you. If you would just take a moment, fill that out, give us some information about yourself. What we'll do is reach back out to you with whatever information you give us, and we'll give you some details about the ministries of St. Andrew. We would love to be able to connect with you in that way. And this morning, our goal is to worship the Lord. And we're going to start our, our time of singing worship with a song called Raise a Hallelujah. That's basically saying in this song that we will praise the Lord regardless of our circumstances. No matter what, we will praise the Lord. So my challenge to you this morning as we begin our time of worship is to let's not just sing about the idea of raising a hallelujah. Let's actually do it. Let's praise the Lord. He is worthy of our worship. Pray with me this morning as we begin our time of worship. Father, we thank you for the ability and the privilege and the responsibility that we have to gather here this morning to worship you. You're worthy of our worship. Our goal this morning is to honor you and exalt you in all that we do as we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. Let's stand and praise the Lord this morning. Just like Jeremy said, we're going to raise a hallelujah. Amen. amen. <clears throat> Fight for me. 
got reasons to raise a hallelujah this morning, don't we? Woo! I know I do.
Amen. You guys can have a seat. Getting ready to take up our offering, and as we do that, I just want to make you aware, if you're not already, our, our students just got home a little later than they were planning because of some bus troubles, but they got home Friday night from a great week at camp um, where they learned about the Lord, trusted Him more. Here's a picture of all of them looking beautiful Friday. So I just want to tell you, this doesn't happen without you, church. Whether you have a teenager or not, maybe you're the person who runs when you see teenagers. But when we give, it makes things like this available. We're able to scholarship students, but also we're able to offset the cost for all the students because camp's <laughs> not cheap. So this, this is so, so valuable in the lives of our students. And I just want to say, if you are someone who gives to St. Andrews, thank you for the investment that you had in these students down here this week. And we're going to continue to do that. And so today, I want to ask you, as, as we give, just think of the story of the widow's might. You may be placing that money in the plate. You may be giving online and saying, this isn't much. There's not much that could happen here. Um, but give to the Lord because he is worthy, because we have faith that even with little, our God does much. Yeah. So let's pray, and we're going to take up our offering. Before we do that, we're going to preteen. We're going to commission our preteens. I knew that. I promise. So our preteens this week, we just finished VBS a few weeks ago here at St. Andrew, and now our preteens are actually going to go across the county to Springfield, and they're going to lead a VBS at the Baptist Center. They're going to be teaching. They're going to be the ones sharing the gospel. They're going to be the ones leading the games. We basically have adults there just because legally we have to. But the preteens do everything as a part of this week. So as they go, they're going to be sharing the gospel, and we want to pray for them. So I'll ask anybody who's a part of this who's not down here already, do that. But then if you would, just extend a hand, and we're going to pray for our preteens as we pray over our offering. God, we thank you that we are a part of a church that teaches students the value of taking your gospel, taking it across the city, and taking it to the ends of the earth. And so we ask, God, that you supernaturally will fill these preteens with your strength, with your wisdom, as they teach your word, as they share your gospel. God, use them. Use them for the glory of your name. Use them for the salvation of kids in Springfield. And use them for your glorious work in their lives, not just this week, but for a lifetime to come. And then, Lord, as we take up our offering, we ask that you would be glorified. God, I confess that what I have is not much. But I've seen all throughout my life the way you have used me for your glory. So much more than anything that I am capable of. And Lord, as I look around the room, I know that that is true of every believer in here. So we give to you because you are worthy. But we give to you because we know that you will get glory from this. And we ask that you would do that. In Jesus' name, amen.
The ninth commandment says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Who here has ever told a lie? If you didn't raise your hand, you just told a lie. <laughs> so what are we? We're all a bunch of liars. <laughs> That means we all need this word from the Lord. Amen? So I don't want to catch anybody running off to a nap this morning. We need to hear this word from God. You know, the basic meaning of this commandment is simple. Tell the truth. Speak the truth. So in preparing for this message, I decided just to look up every time the word truth appears, and I use the New King James Version because that's the version I use as my primary Bible for both study and preaching. So I looked up every time the Bible uses the word truth in the New King James Version. I started with the first reference in Genesis. Now, I will tell you when I saw that it appears 223 times in the Bible, I did not intend to read every one. I was just going to kind of scan it. But as I read through the first dozen or so completely, I saw building in the scriptures going from Genesis to Revelation a progression of God's revelation about truth, of God giving us the most basic things that we need to know about truth, but moving when we got to the New Testament about the finer points of dealing with truth and the things that conflict with truth in the lives of a believer, in the lives of a Christian. That progression was so meaningful, I thought about just reading those verses to you as the message today. But I quickly did a little calculation and figured, well, if each verse just takes 30 seconds to read, then we're going to still be here when the folks start coming in for the 1030 service. And we're going to only be about halfway through, and they are not going to know what's going on. And I don't want you to miss your life change groups either. So I've just picked out some of the most important ones to take us through this. But I warn you that this morning as I preach, I am going to reference a lot of Scripture. Because I want you to see this unfolding in God's Word as much as we can without reading every single verse. So I'll start by asking the first question that we have asked of every one of the commandments. What does the ninth commandment reveal about God? Well, first of all, it tells us that God is a God of truth. In Exodus it says the Lord passed before him, that's Moses, and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. And in Deuteronomy, it says of the Lord, he is the rock. His work is perfect. All of his ways are justice, a God of truth, and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Our God is a God of truth. It is a part of his character. It is a part of who God is, and it tells us because of that, God values truth. Truth 
is important to God. And then it tells us God's word is truth. The psalmist said, the entirety of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Folks, if God is a God of truth, and he is, how could his word be anything else? How could God breathe a word that is not truth when he himself is truth? The psalmist also said, I will praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. Folks, did you hear that? What an unusual passage of scripture this is where it says that God has magnified his word above his name. Do you know that this is the only thing that God allows to be exalted above his name is his word. And we read that God's truth lasts forever. The psalmist said, for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Folks, never get the idea, no matter how young or how old you are, that you have passed by this truth. That this is such an ancient word that it does not speak to you. That it does not address the needs of your life. That it does not speak to the culture and the world in which you live. This is a word that is to all generations. For our God is an everlasting God who never changes He is the same as he was, as he had already been for since eternity past. When he created the heavens and the earth, he is the same today. He will be the same when eternity future is in motion. And we who know the Lord rule and reign with Christ, yet God will be the same and his word the same. So let's ask the second question. How does God want this portion of his character, the fact that God is truth, that how does he want this to show in our lives? How can we reflect that in our lives? Well, the psalmist asked and then answered this question. Lord, who can abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? In other words, who, Lord, can abide with you? Who can have fellowship with you? And then he gives God the answer. He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. Listen, folks. These scriptures that we have been studying now for nine weeks, these are not the ten suggestions. They are the ten commandments. And they are the Ten Commandments because every one of them is built on the character of God. They are built upon who God is. These were the standards of God before the law was ever written. They are the standards of God after the law fell away and God promised a new covenant. But they are based upon his character. And God is a God of truth. And he says, if you want to have fellowship with me, If you want to walk with me on a daily basis, then you must be a truth speaker and not a liar. 
even when you say something or you make a promise that in the aftermath turns out bad for you. You promise something, but then when it comes time for fulfillment, you say, oh, but I didn't think of that. Oh, but, but things have changed. Who abides with the Lord? He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. Because it is important to God that we tell the truth even when it brings difficult consequences for ourselves. The psalmist said, for the word of the Lord is right and all of his work is done in truth. Now we who are saved are always about his work. You know, it's not just what we do to serve the Lord on Sundays or if we have some special mission that we're working on. Yes, that's the work of the Lord. But but friend, we are to be doing the Lord's work day in and day out every moment uh, of every hour. We are to be about the Lord's work just as Jesus, when he was 12 years old, said, I must be about my father's business. And we who follow the Lord, who have trusted the Lord Jesus, we are to be about his business every moment of every day. And he says all of his work is done in truth. I tell you, the scarcity of truth is bringing at this very moment the downfall of our nation. Isaiah said to Israel, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor is his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Listen to this. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue has muttered perversity. No one calls for justice, nor does any plead for truth. They trust in empty words and speak lies. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. And Isaiah says this is the reason why God has rejected Israel. This is the reason that that Israel and Judah shall go into captivity. This is the reason that the first covenant will be declared invalid. And I will have to promise a new covenant yet to, to come. Now, these words were initially spoken to the people of Israel, but friend, they apply to every nation. They are true for every people group. They describe the results of spin gone wild, where few care about the truth, but they just speak whatever lies they believe will accomplish their own purpose. Then the scripture tells us that God is not only concerned about the spoken truth, but God knows that for a person to be a faithful speaker of truth, truth must abide in his heart. God's not just concerned about the outward expression. He knows that if we lie with our lips, that that comes from a heart that is deceitful. So now let's move to the New Testament. What does the New Testament say that helps us to understand this commandment even more fully and how we can live it out day to day in our lives? Well, the first thing we ought to note, folks, is that Jesus was the truth incarnate. Jesus was the truth put into flesh and blood of a human being. Luke says, then they ask him, saying, Teacher, we know that what you say and teach is right, and you do not show personal favoritism, 
but you teach the way of God in truth. I love how John put it. Speaking of Jesus, he says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John further said, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And then he said, quoting Jesus, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Folks, listen. Listen to these next two things. Nail this down in your heart. God desires for all people to know the truth. Not only speaking individually, but speaking of people groups. God desires that all people would know the truth so they can trust in Christ who is the truth incarnate. The Holy Spirit told Paul to write to Timothy and gave him these words. For this is a good and acceptable good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. There's the heart of God. There's the desire of God. He wants all men to come to a knowledge, to an understanding of the truth, and then to be saved. He goes on to say, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. All. He gave himself as a ransom for all when he was upon that cross to be testified in due time. Folks, those who reject Jesus do so because they reject the truth. Which is the same reason that the devil rejects Jesus. In John chapter 8, John records that Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. He says, why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father the devil, Jesus said to them. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. In other words, he speaks out of his own heart for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, Jesus said, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Folks, listen. The reason people reject Jesus is not because there are strong and convincing arguments against the existence of God or against the deity of Christ. They reject Jesus as their Lord 
because they do not want to repent and abandon the sin which they enjoy. Jesus said, you don't understand what I'm saying because you desire to do what the devil wants you to do. You know, the Holy Spirit said the same thing through the Apostle Paul when he wrote the book of Romans, the great book of doctrine in our Bibles. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The Holy Spirit is declaring through Paul that the problem is that they cannot bring themselves to understand or believe the truth. They just can't make themselves do it. They suppress the truth because they love living in unrighteousness. And they know if they believe the truth, it leads to repentance, to salvation, and to transformation. The truth leads people to Jesus. And Jesus, the truth of God, sets them free. Free from sin, free from death. John, again quoting Jesus, said, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth of God's word, and specifically the gospel, is what breaks our bondage to sin. Doesn't mean we'll never sin again, but it means we'll no longer be enslaved to sin. It breaks the bondage to both sin and and death. Oh, that glorious gospel. You can sum it up in just three statements. That Jesus Christ, God's Son, died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. On the third day, he rose from the dead and appeared to more than 500 people alive. Jesus now offers forgiveness of sin and eternal life to anyone who will believe in him and trust him as their Savior and Lord. My friend, listen. If you will believe in your heart that Jesus died on that cross for your sins, and that he rose from the dead and is alive today. And then you will turn to him in faith and invite him to come in to be the ruler of your life. To be the Lord, the master of your life. The scripture says that all of your sins will be forgiven. They'll be washed away. And God will give to you the most precious gift of eternal life. And you will live in his presence forever, forever. And then Jesus said, God's word is truth. Affirming exactly what the Old Testament had said, the entirety of your word is truth. Jesus said, in a prayer, praying for us, praying for those who would believe in future years. Jesus prayed for us and he said, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. And God wants us to believe his word. He wants us to believe everything in his word and to live our lives accordingly. Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica and he said, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is, the truth 
the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Listen to my plea, young adults. Listen to me literally begging you, teenagers. If I had one wish that something in my childhood or teenage years had been different, it would be this one thing. That someone would have read me these two verses we just read in the scriptures. Or one or two of the other hundreds of verses like them that speak the same thing to teach me, to encourage me to know that Jesus himself said the Bible was absolutely true. And I wish that because seven years of my life as a young adult, I spent wandering in a spiritual wasteland because I doubted the veracity and the reliability of the scriptures. And I'll tell you, the problem was not that people had any evidence that convinced me that something in the Bible was not true. The problem was they just cast doubt. They, they just cast doubting questions that led me to assume that the proofs were there. And that the proofs ran contrary to the scriptures. I'll tell you when I finally responded to a challenge that, that I believe God himself put before me through the, the lips of a teenager to examine the evidence, to see if indeed the Bible was true or not. I found tons of evidence for the absolute perfection of the Holy Scriptures. Literally mountains of reason support that was nearly impossible to contradict. I'm telling you, if you have doubts about the absolute trustworthiness of the Bible, just invest some time in examining the evidence. You don't have to take my word for it. Look at the evidence with your own eyes and consider it in your own mind. The evidence is readily available to you by way of books, or even by way of, of videos that are available on the internet. It is out there everywhere that you can, you can look and you can find and examine. The God who created this universe. And who will one day sit as judge over it all. Is the God of truth. And his word is truth. Folks, and let me tell you, having made it abundantly available to each of us. Oh, the story of God's miraculous work in, pre in, in preserving this word across the centuries without change. It is a most marvelous story I wish this morning I had the time to tell. But God has preserved his word that we can have it. And now, God holds us accountable. God holds us responsible for reading it and knowing it, believing that it is true, and living it out in our lives. To help us do that, God gives us the Holy Spirit who is called the Spirit of Truth. And the scripture says the spirit of truth dwells with you and will be in you. The scripture tells us that true love rejoices in the truth. In 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter says all these wonderful things about love. 
but this it says, love rejoices in the truth. And therefore, we are to speak the truth in love. God wants us to be truth speakers, but as we speak the truth, he wants the motive and the attitude of our heart to be love for the people to whom we are speaking it. <coughs> Folks, as we are attacked by the evil one, God wants us to just literally wrap ourselves in the truth as we put on the armor of God to withstand the attacks of Satan. A part of the armor of God, Paul says, is having girded your waist with truth. And then he tells us, and the church. The church is to be the pillar and the ground of truth. Paul writing to Timothy says, I write that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. And then he said, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. And he's not just talking about, about pastors there. He's not just talking about evangelists or, or even vocational missionaries. He's talking about all of us. The word preach means proclaim, share, share the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. We live in that day. All the more reason for us to be the ones who speak the truth, who believe the truth, who share the truth with others. Stand with me. Let's pray. Father, I pray that we will not only be people who despise the lie, but that we will be people who love the truth. Father, I pray that we would be people who respond to the truth even this morning. I pray for those who have not yet come to faith in Christ. That they will trust Him this morning as their Lord and Savior. I pray for those who do not have what they would call a church home. A place where they regularly worship study God's word and serve the Lord, that they would desire to become a part of our church, that we might stand as a pillar in the ground of truth in our declaration of the word of God and in the living out of that word in our lives. And then God, only you know the particular areas of our life where our lives stand contrary to the truth where we know the truth but we're not living the truth God right now your spirit deals with our heart about those things may we respond to you today may we say Lord I know the truth and now I will repent of this sin in my life and I will live out the truth may it be so in Jesus name We worship the Lord in this song, which is also a time of invitation. If you would trust Christ today, you come in this time of invitation. Come to me or one of the other pastors. Just say, I want to trust the Lord. We'll help you. If you want to come into this church family, you can come. Say, I want to be a part of this church. We'll help you. If you want to come and just kneel or stand at the front, just use it as a personal altar to deal with that thing that God is convicting your heart about 
where you know that this area of your life is contrary to the truth, then you come. While we sing, you come. Only you can make it right may be seated. Deacons, you may go to prepare to serve the Lord's Supper, please. You know, church, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and said, for indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. This morning we are going to celebrate, participate in the Lord's Supper, which is our new Passover meal. Let us do that with sincerity of heart. Let us do that according to the truth. Now, congregation, let me make it clear. If you have trusted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, whether you're a member of this church or or not, if you've trusted the Lord, we invite you to participate in the Lord's Supper with us as we remember the broken body and the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. In a moment when the deacons pass the trays to you, you will find Two cups stacked one on top of the other. Take both. The top cup has the grape juice. The bottom cup has the unleavened bread. Now the worship band is going to lead us in a marvelous song of worship about the supper called Remembrance. As you pick up on that song or if you know it, you join in with the worship band while we sing and our deacons are going to serve us. Put out in 
During his final Passover meal with his disciples, Jesus took the unleavened bread. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
and he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. It has become a good tradition of our church that on the day that we honor the Lord through the taking of the Lord's Supper, that we give a special offering we call our Helping Hands Offering that goes both to members of our congregation and to people outside of our church who have special needs so that we can share in those needs to help meet those in the name of the Lord Jesus. There will be people at the doors that will be collecting this offering, a helping hands offering. Stand with me. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God, who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You are dismissed.